It was um, 40 years ago today at about this moment when I was baptized in the uh, North Atlantic at a uh, beach called uh, Sea Point Beach in Kittery, Maine. Um, the fellow who presided at the service was named Jim Mortensen. He had just moved into the ward. No one knew who Jim Mortensen was, and there he was on the beach, and um, he's become infamous for a statement that he made. Uh, we had another baptism 18 days later, and he didn't like that there were people in the area um, somehow enjoying that awfully cold water, and the statement he made rather gruffly was, <clears throat> let's move it up the beach, elders. He's an old Marine. He used to um, fly uh, combat missions off of a flat-top carrier in Vietnam, and he had all the demeanor of a flat-top carrier pilot. His wife was uh, Monty. Her maiden name was Bunker. She was from the Nevada Bunkers. Um, Bishop Bunker got in a whole lot of trouble because he did not buy the Adam God theory. And Bishop Bunker had a trial for excommunication because of heresy. And Bishop Bunker's <clears throat> bishop couldn't quite reach a conclusion on what to do. And as a consequence of that, it was tabled. Wilfred Woodruff came down. They had another convening of the church court. Ultimately, um, they decided to punt rather than to do anything. And the uh, doctrinal exposition that Bishop Bunker made uh, has since become the doctrine of the church, although at the time it was dangerous heresy for the man to preach it. Monty... Um, she was at the time and is still today one of the loveliest women I have ever met. She texted me a little earlier today on my way here and said, do you beware of pride? <laughs> um, their son texted me today too. You know, shortly after that, um, ceremony I was ordained to the Aaronic priesthood by George Hoger uh, George was the elders quorum president not knowing what one ought to do in order to be ordained and George being the primary guy I asked him to ordain me so I have a priesthood line of authority that reckons through uh, George George's wife was Judy Judy was a nun who converted to Mormonism while she was living in a convent. She asked Mother Superior for permission to be baptized. And of course, consent was given, but she was told, you've got to have new premises because you can't reside here. Um, <laughs> Judy grew up... Um, Judy grew up Catholic, devout, became a nun. She was, for goodness sake, Christ's bride. And therefore, when George proposed to her and they were going to actually have marital relations, she tells the most hilarious stories about her premarital schooling when she asked about what was to be expected. I'll leave that aside. <laughs> Eighteen days after my baptism, I mentioned it already, um, I baptized a fellow. Eighteen days from now, we will give the second of these talks um, commemorating the gratitude that I hold for the doctrines that I have been taught. You know, no one should be allowed in the missionary department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who isn't a convert, better still an adult convert to the church. Because no one joins because of some silly program. You join because of doctrine. And when you choke away the doctrine, there's no reason to stay. 
And so, in gratitude for the principles which brought me aboard the restoration, we're going to spend this next year looking at the doctrine that compels belief. That doctrine which doesn't abuse, control, compel, but invites and entices, that is delicious, that makes you hunger for more. The principles of the gospel that not only edify, but enlighten and enliven. The kinds of things which, despite everything else that separates you, you find you can come together in love and in appreciation. That's the gospel. That's the restoration. I know of no more cheerful a being in the universe than Christ. When he says, be of good cheer, we ought to all accept that as the mantra. There is nothing that any of us will ever go through that he hasn't gone through with a considerable greater degree of difficulty. He lived with a higher specific gravity than any of us had to ever fight against. And he won for each of us a prize that is potentially eternal. It will be eternal one way or the other but if you take full measure of what he offers, it will be delightfully eternal. Cowardice is largely predicated upon fear. Don't be cowardly. Don't be fearful. Fear is the opposite of faith. For goodness sake, you're already in the battle. You're already going to be overtaken. The fact of the matter is that no one gets out of here alive. Live this life nobly, fearlessly. When you take the wounds that come your way, you make sure that they come to your front. Don't let them shoot you in the back. Go about your life boldly, nobly, valiantly, because it is only through valiance in the testimony of Jesus Christ that you can hope to secure anything. Not valiance in your fidelity to anything other than Jesus Christ. The fact of the matter is that faith must be based in him and him alone. We'll get to that in Idaho Falls. Tonight I want to introduce some ideas that are essential to salvation coming through the prophet Joseph Smith, which we really need to become reacquainted with. Um, first a deviation, and I, and I have to say I'm, I'm deviating because I like the quote. I like the quote because of the substance of what is being said. I don't like the object of the adoration. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not heaping praise on the fellow who's the object of this statement. But it's good wording, and I like it. Andrew of St. Victor made the statement in 1170. He was talking about St. Jerome, who is largely responsible for the compilation of the Latin Vulgate Bible which the Book of Mormon has absolutely no good thing to say about. It leads you into darkness. It uh, takes away the covenants. It's part of making you blind. It's a big problem. Despite that, <clears throat> let's take this praise and let's assume that this praise is applicable to someone who is worthy of it. In this case, Joseph. That learned man knew how obscure truth is, how deep it lies buried, how far from mortal sight 
it is plunged into the depths, how it will admit only a few, by how much work it is reached, how practically no one ever succeeds, how it is dug out with difficulty and then only bit by bit. Joseph said, knowledge saves a man. And in the world of spirits, no man can be exalted but by knowledge. He also said in another talk, when you climb up a ladder, you must begin at the bottom and ascend step by step until you arrive at the top. And so it is with the principles of the gospel. You must begin with the first and go on until you learn all the principles of exaltation. But it will be a great while after you pass through the veil before you have ever learned them. It's not all to be comprehended in this world. It will be a great work to learn our salvation and exaltation even beyond the grave. Now, if you go back and you reread that quote and you comprehend that it is possible to pass through the veil before you leave here, It will be a great while after you pass through the veil before you will have learned them. It's not all to be comprehended in this world. You begin to say, ah, I think I understand why after 40 years of reflection, Nephi commented about how it was his constant meditation to think upon the things which he had seen and heard. A knowledge obtained from heaven is dynamic. Another place Joseph said, A man is saved no faster than he gets knowledge. For if he does not get knowledge, he will be brought into captivity by some evil power in the other world. As evil spirits will have more knowledge and consequently more power than many men who are on the earth. Hence it needs revelation to assist us and give us knowledge of the things of God. We equate in large measure, repentance with whatever it is you're doing with your genitals. Joseph equates redemption and repentance with whatever it is you're doing with your heart and with your mind. The problem that we have is our profound ignorance. And what the gospel offers defies ignorance subdues it, challenges it, destroys it, leaves it in the dark. And so let's try and search into and obtain some illumination. First, I want to read a passage from Job and misapply it, if you will. I want you to imagine that what I'm reading is not merely a description of a mortal horse. But what I'm reading is a description of those horses which pull the chariot upon which Elijah ascended to heaven. This is the horse you need to ride in your quest for heaven. This is the way in which you, too, are to mount up. Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He paweth in the valley and rejoiceth in his strength. He goeth on to meet the armed men. He mocketh at fear and is not affrighted. Neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him, the glittering spear and the shield. He swalloweth the ground with the fierceness and rage. Neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. He saith among the trumpets, Ha! And he smelleth the battle afar off. 
the thunder of the captains and the shouting. As the battle engages, ride the horse, not away, but toward the sound. 1838 was a terrible year. It was one that followed a terrible year. Late 1837, the church in Kirtland was in turmoil. Several hundred saints questioned Joseph Smith's divine calling, withdrew from the church. In July of 1837, the Kirtland Safety Society was for, forced to close its doors. There were a number of people who tried to take over leadership of the church to get Joseph void, uh, voted out. They wanted to force the first presidency from office and then oust them from Kirtland entirely. Among the people that had descended was Warren Parrish, the one-time scribe and secretary to Joseph Smith, two of the, three of the apostles, John F. Boynton, Luke, and Lyman Johnson, 70s, Hazen uh, Aldridge, Leonard Rich, Sylvester Smith, John Gould, John Grayson, even Martin Harris, one of the witnesses to the Book of Mormon. In January of 1838, Joseph Smith got a revelation that it said, and I'm reading from it, as soon as practical, when a door is open for them to move to the West as fast as the way is made and played before their hearts, they ought to depart. On the night of the day on which that revelation came, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon fled Kirtland. Fled at night. They were chased by people for 200 miles trying to kill Joseph. This is in January of 1838. This is the beginning of this, this year. Now if we back up, you can look it up. It's Doctrine and Covenants section 47 verse 1. In Doctrine and Covenants section 47 verse 1, we run into something that is of interest to our topic. Verse 1, Behold, and this is a revelation given on March 8th of 1831. Behold, it is expedient in me that my servant John, that is John Whitmer, brother of David Whitmer, one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon, John should write and keep a regular history and assist you, my servant Joseph, in transcribing all things which should be given you until he is called to further duties. And so beginning on March the 8th of 1831 and going on thereafter, the history of the church was maintained by John Whitmer. John Whitmer, the church historian. The saints had been expelled from Jackson County in 1833 and 1834, then Zion's Camp in 1837, then the Kirtland Safety Society collapsed, the rebellion, the loss of Kirtland, the nighttime flight, and the departure to um, Missouri. Beginning early in 1838, there were rumors of immoral conduct that were levied against Joseph Smith. There was a church court by April the 12th of 1838. The Far West High Council brought nine charges against uh, Oliver Cowdery, the assistant president uh, to the church. One of the charges was, and I'm, I'm reading a quote, for seeking to destroy the character of President Joseph Smith, Jr. by falsely insinuating that he was guilty of adultery, etc. The court in that proceeding ultimately excommunicated Oliver Cowdery. Uh, David Whitmer left the church, was excommunicated. John Whitmer, the church historian, was excommunicated. Hiram Page, W.W. W. Phelps, um, Sidney Rigdon, in June of 1838, delivered the salt sermon where he talked about how dissenters were worthy of being trodden like, like salt that was contaminated under the feet of the saints. Um, that ignited uh, the anti-Mormons. It caused some of the disaffected people to go over to encourage the, um, the further rebellion. There were affidavits that year from Thomas Marsh, who was the president of the Quorum of the Twelve, um, testifying against Joseph and the church. Orson Hyde also signed an affidavit implicating Joseph Smith. There was a Mormon war in 1838. 
The Battle of Crooked River was fought on October 24th of 1828, or excuse me, 38. The extermination order was issued on October 27th of 1838. Hans Mill massacre occurred on October 30th, and Joseph Smith surrendered um, at Far West while it was under siege, and on November the 1st, he was sentenced to death at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning in the public square at Far West. Well, this is the year in which Joseph Smith, because there was no history, set about to compose a replacement history. This is the year, and these are the circumstances in which the Joseph Smith history and the Pearl of Great Price got composed. Joseph Smith, against all of the odds, against all of the opposition, against all of the treachery, against all of the betrayal by his brethren who ought to know better, against all of those who should have known the man's heart, instead turned on him, composed what is as an act of faith and kindness, a testimony that seeks to reclaim those who misapprehend the work of God. Now you can say that Joseph Smith wrote various versions of the first vision and that what we have in the 1838 version is um, a, an innovation, an invention. The fact of the matter is that Nephi did not compose what he composed until about 40 years after the event because it was time and distance and reflection that gave him the ability to put into words the truth of what it was he experienced. In the terrible circumstances of 1838, when Joseph Smith set about to compose his testimony of his history, this statement was itself an audacious, faith-filled, act of revelation to defend what had gone on and to explain what had gone on. We don't have Joseph Smith's 1838 history anymore. It's been lost. It's not been recovered. When you look at the, um, the history, the Joseph Smith papers, what you find is that there is an 1839 copy that was prepared by Mulholland and it is the Mulholland version that appears in the Joseph Smith History and the Pearl of Great Price. But we reckon that it is a copy of what Joseph wrote in 1838 because of the internal dating of the document. He says that being, being now the eighth year since the organization of the said church, that's in verse 2 of the Joseph Smith History, in brackets they have inserted the year 1838, that was the year in which Joseph wrote. And that's apparently... Mulholland copying Joseph's writing the previous year. So, when you start out with the Joseph Smith history, and you read the words, Owing to the many reports which have been put in circulation by evil disposed and designing persons, in relation to the rise and progress of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, recognize that what he's talking about are the statements that are made by people of his own faith about him. This is Joseph Smith describing the problems that are circulating as a result of members of the Quorum of the Twelve aligned against him. Members of the Seventy that are aligned against him and as prophets often do, they have the way to put it back into context and into clarity with inspired words as we read here. In this history, he says in verse 2, I shall present the various events in relation to this church in truth and righteousness as they have transpired, or as they exist at present, or present exist, being now the eighth year since the organization of the said church. Therefore, as he begins to defend the church, 
he starts with what is essential about the church. I was born in the year of our Lord, 1805, on the 23rd day of December. Because if you want to know the truth about the church, you must know the truth about its founding prophet. To the extent that there is anything desirable that exists within it, it exists within it as a consequence of the ministry of this prophet. Therefore, if you want to find the truth, you have to look at Joseph, born on the 23rd day of December, the day after the winter solstice, the day in which the sunlight won its triumph over the darkness, the first day in which the hours of light and the hours of darkness begin to switch and light begins to prevail. A moment that is reckoned anciently as one of the four corners of the earth. Joseph's coming into the world at that moment was uh, no accident. Well, in verse 5, he starts talking about how there's no small stir and division amongst the people, some crying low here and others low there. Some were contending for the Methodists, some for the Presbyterians, some for the Baptists. Religion divides in 1838. In 1820, in 2013, and it ought not. Joseph, in verse 6, commends to us something. One of the litmus tests, he's suggesting that ought to be applied. Perhaps those who are in a state of rebellion, those who are in a state of um, rejection, those who are fighting against the word of the Lord that comes through him. Perhaps they will take a step back and look at what Joseph has to say because it was seen that the seemingly good feelings of both the priests and the converts were more pretended than real. For a scene of great confusion and bad feeling ensued, priest contending against priest and convert against convert, so that all their good feelings, one for another, if they ever had any, were entirely lost in a strife of words and a contest about opinions. You know, at the time Joseph inserts the clause, if they ever had any, I can't help but think that he was lamenting the potential false feelings that had been demonstrated by those of his own faith who had pretended to have affection for him. Well... Verse 8, once again, so great were the confusion and strife among the different denominations, it was impossible for a person young as I was and so unacquainted with men and things to come to any certain conclusion who was right and who was wrong. See, that's, that's the way it is. In verse 10, there's always this war of, worlds, war of words. A war of worlds, that's what your kids play. Um, <laughs> war of words and tumult of opinions. And so Joseph is um, confused. How do you resolve this? Verse 11, while it was laboring, while I was laboring, you folks in general have your skulls so junked up with the crap of the internet that you don't even have the capacity to labor the way it needs to be labored to solve the questions that need to be solved. It is labor. It is labor over the scriptures. It is labor under the extreme difficulties caused by these parties of religionists. It was one day reading the epistle of James, first chapter, fifth, fifth verse, which reads, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Let him ask of God. God gives to all 
men liberally, and it braideth not, and it shall be given him. I can ask God, God will give to me, God will give to me liberally. God will not tell me. There are lines here you mustn't cross. There are things about which you must not inquire. There are things your heart is not yet prepared to receive. You don't have standing. He gives liberally. He can let you know what you need to know from your study and inquiry into the truth. And no man can stop that because this is a matter between you and God. It has always been a matter between you and God. There is no friar with a brown frock that you need to bend the knee to in order to please God. If Joseph had known that, the friar with the frock, he would never have achieved the revolution that he achieved. Well, when you're laboring, as verse 11 suggests, and when you hit the right verse, as verse 11 recites, then verse 12 confirms how you get answers to these kinds of inquiries. Never did any passage of scripture come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. It seemed to enter with great force. You know, turn back to um, Doctrine and Covenants section 76. And look at verse 18. This is the vision of the redemption of the dead that gave us the three degrees of glory. The reading in John. And he gives you the, um, the verse in John that they were reading in verses 16 and 17. And look at 18. Now this caused us to marvel, for it was given unto us of the Spirit. The Spirit cannot lean upon you and cannot focus your mind upon the revelation that you are entitled to receive unless you use the scriptures as they were intended to be used as a Urim and Thummim, as the basis from which you draw out the truths of God. And the best version of that is, of course, the Book of Mormon. You can look at DNC section 138, and you'll find that Joseph F. Smith sat in his room pondering over the scriptures. He's near death. It's about eight weeks before the death of Joseph F. Smith. Church had a lot of challenges going on at that time. Fortuitously for us, the man who sat at home, infirm, and worried about death, happened to happily be the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so when he got an answer, not to his inquiry about leading the church, when he got a, a, an answer to an inquiry that had nothing to do with his position or... Um, budgets or anything else that manages an organization. It had to do with his own concern about his own deepest apprehensions, his impending death, which would follow about eight weeks after this. The scriptures opened like a Urim and Thummim to his view, and we get a vision of the redemption of the dead, which we've now canonized. It entered, this is back uh, verse 12 of the Joseph Smith history, it entered into uh, his heart with great force of every feeling of my heart. I reflected on it again and again. Now that's an interesting statement because it doesn't appear 
that this labor was a one-off event, but that occurred over and over as he sought more understanding, searching deeper and deeper into trying to understand what it was he ought to do and how it is he ought to accomplish it. Again and again, knowing if any person needed wisdom from God, I did. You should be asking God so that you can understand Scripture. You shouldn't be trusting the expositions of anyone, myself included. These Scriptures have a message for you. God has a message for you. God would like to talk to you, not through me or any other man. God would like to talk with you. You'd be saved by knowledge. And the things you need to know are uniquely situated. The things you have the right to get from God are uniquely situated. I got an answer from God. That's why 40 years ago today, I went in and I got baptized. Elder Brian Black baptized me. During the baptismal service, because it was approaching twilight, the sun was beginning to set, the moon had emerged, and the first stars began to shine, and Brian Black commented in the talk that was given by him before laying on hands, that all of the signs of heaven, the sun, the moon, and the stars, had been visible during my baptismal ceremony. I have felt the presence of God with me from that moment through today. Just this morning, I checked into my office before coming here, and when I arrived at my office, there was a dove on the lawn to meet me, and she stayed there as I went by. Now, it's a small thing, but if you're acquainted with the scriptures, you understand what such a symbol can mean, and to me, did mean. Your lives should be filled with wonder. Be not faithless, but be believing, and be of good cheer. He knows you better than you know yourself. I was belly aching about an idiot, friend. Um, <laughs> And as I am wont to do, it was prayerful. State president asked me a few weeks ago about whether I was praying at the time that I had one of the encounters he and I discussed. Um, and I said, it's not a fair question. Um, I wake up in the morning and I start to pray. Throughout the day, I will take care of a thousand things, and whenever I am free, my mind will revert back to the prayer, and will continue the dialogue, and it goes on all day. There is not a moment in my life in which I am not being prayerful. And so, the answer to the question is, I suppose, yes, I was praying, because there's hardly a moment when I'm idle, when I am not praying. Well... God intends to speak to each of us about us and about what matters to us and about what matters to you. He, unlike us, is not bounded by the linear existence that we have. All things, past, present, and future, are continually before the Lord. In fact, it's really sort of an interesting study. If you, if you take and you look at what the Lord does in 3 Nephi, he has this agenda that he's been assigned by the Lord, or by the Father. And, and Christ discharges the agenda, and he, and he goes through, and as you read the, the chapters in 3 Nephi, it's really structured, it's really orderly. And then he announces, now, now I've finished what the Father told me to deliver to you. And he just begins to talk. And as he begins to talk, what unfolds is non-chronological. 
It's topical, but it's past, present, and future. His thoughts are not like our, th our thoughts. They aren't. They're nonlinear. Sometimes <laughs> that's not easy. Um, at length, he says in verse 13, I came to the conclusion I must either remain in darkness and confusion or else I must do as James directs, that is, ask of God. And so it is for all of us. You want to know the truth of the proposition? You ask God. And don't be fearful. If you ask, he'll answer. But you better be prepared for the answer. Because the battle that is already upon us is going to require valiance. Cowardly, effeminate, hen-like behavior can never, never obtain the promises of God. Christ asked, what went you forth to see? A reed shaking in the wind? <laughs> that's, that's what you want? I don't think John the Baptist cried on demand. And Zion is in a bank. <laughs> so it is in accordance with this, my determination to ask of God, I retired to the woods to make the attempt. It was on the morning of a beautiful, clear day, early in the spring of 1820. It's the first time in my life I'd made such an attempt. For amidst all my anxieties, I'd never as yet made the attempt to pray vocally. After I'd retired to the place where I'd previously designed, finding myself alone, I kneeled down, began to offer up the desires of my heart to God. I'd scarcely done so, and immediately I was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me, had such an astonishing influence over me as to bind my tongue so that I could not speak. Thick darkness gathered around me. It seemed to me for a time as if I were doomed to sudden destruction. You know, we have Orson Hyde's account of this thick darkness. I don't want to read it to you. This is Orson Hyde writing about the, the incident we just looked at. He, therefore, retired to a secret place in a grove, but a short distance from his father's house, and knelt down and began to call upon the Lord. At first, he was severely tempted by the powers of darkness, which endeavored to overcome him. The adversary benighted his mind with doubts and brought to his soul all kinds of improper pictures and tried to hinder him in his efforts and the accomplishment of his goal. However, the overflowing mercy of God came to buoy him up. You know, if salvation consists in obtaining knowledge, you can't afford to clutter your mind with the kinds of things which can readily summer up, summon up improper images, improper thoughts, improper ambitions. In fact, it doesn't matter what you want. There's only one thing that matters, and that is what is the Lord's will for you, with you. And that will is always the same, to bring about your happiness, ultimately to bring about your joy. He tells you that his burden is light, because however it may seem, in the direful circumstances of 1838 in the life of Joseph Smith, this statement of faith, this testimony of truth was worth the price that Joseph was called upon to pay to obtain it. The things of God are infinitely preferable to anything that can be offered to you here in this world. You may indeed 
be able to buy anything in this world for money. But don't let that ever be the case with your heart or your soul. Zion will not have an economy because they have all things in common. So Joseph in verse 16 tells you that it is some um, marvelous power from the unseen world. Let me take you back to that statement. A man is saved no faster than he gets knowledge, for if he does not get knowledge, he will, brought in, he will be brought into captivity by some evil power in the other world, as evil spirits will have more knowledge and consequently more power. Well, apply that quote in the context of um, what Joseph is experiencing there. And, um, and realize this is not uh, uh, merely something that will happen after you depart this world. It's something that, in fact, does happen here. I mean, being blinded here is part of being captured by the captivity of the adversary to your soul. Awake and arise and shake off the scales that blind you. Scales which, like contact lenses, on the one hand, but scales like judging wrongly, on the other hand. You have to judge a matter of right. And if the judgment that you judge is not just, then the scales of your eyes are darkness indeed and so he called upon God to escape this being from the unseen world and he saw a pillar of light exactly over his head above the brightness of the sun which descended gradually until it fell upon me it no sooner appeared than I found myself delivered from the enemy which held me bound when the light rested upon me, I saw two personages. We'll get into this more in uh, Idaho Falls. He saw two personages. Note the word. Joseph knows what he's talking about. He was in the presence of these beings. He will later describe them as a doctrinal exposition, which the church accepted as doctrine and which was, for a season, in your scriptures. That's why you need to bring your articles of faith to uh, Idaho Falls. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name. Um, I've mentioned this uh, on a number of occasions. I want to mention it again here. When God calls a person by name, it is not your full legal name. Joseph Smith Jr. I mean, that's my Cecil B. DeMille version of uh, Ten Commandments, the voice of God, Moses. The casual friendship. I don't know what Joseph was called at this point in his life. I don't know if it was Joey. I don't know if it was Junior. I don't know what the name was that he went by. Whoever his most intimate companion was. That was what the Lord called him. If it was Joey, it was Joey. God doesn't call you by mm, whatever your driver's license is. So he called him by name. Do you know how comforting it is to have God call you by a familiar name? instead of recoiling in horror he's drawing you in instead of stiff arming you like I am the great and powerful he wants you comfortable in his presence so much so 
But when you enter into his presence, it is a matter of course that God invariably forgives your sins. Isaiah, in the temple, saw God high and lifted up. And his first reaction is, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And a seraphim, one of the fiery ones, we ought to know more about that, improvises an ordinance where they take a coal with tongs off the altar and touch his lips to purify them. And the Lord says, who shall I send? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. The same man that is cowering, woe is me, is now, here am I, send me. And what accounts for the difference? The compassion, the forgiveness, the integrity of the Lord. I know thou art a God of truth and cannot lie. When he testifies to you that your sins are forgiven, only a fool will thereafter charge you with sin. The world is stocked with fools. So. Well, here now we have this peculiar scene where a young lad put at ease by the Almighty, calling him by an intimate name, putting him in the position where he's been drawn into intimacy with Almighty himself, is then given a pause. You see, they're not quick to speak. In that respect, they remind me a lot of, um, of Enoch. Uh, slow of speech. You see, they'll wait. And they waited. And so now you have the lad. My object in going to inquire the Lord was to know to which of all the sects was right, that I might know which to join. Oof, no, uh, sooner, therefore, <clears throat> did I get possession of myself so as to be able to speak, then I asked the personages who stood before me. We don't know how long this took. We don't know how long it takes a lad to get himself composed. To God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, it didn't matter. God is in no hurry. And he's in no hurry to fix you. He will wait on whatever it is you need to be allowed to dispose of to come along and he will wait and so when he finally recomposes himself and he poses the question which should I join verse 19 I was answered that I must join none of them for they were all wrong the person that you addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, that those professors were all corrupt, that they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for doctrines the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. This is a mixture of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Paul, all woven together, the words of Scripture, into a um, brief commentary on the sweep from the Old to the New Testament in language of prophets we all recognize, condemning the entirety of the Christian world. Now Joseph is composing this in 1838. He's putting into words of scripture the concepts that flowed into his mind from the Lord. Sometimes the Lord leaves it to you to put words to it. And sometimes the Lord gives you the words. Uh, section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the words were given. I don't know which verse 19 is, whether these are the exact words that were given Joseph, or if this was instead the concept that Joseph was left with the challenge of putting into words. Either way, it is light, it is truth, and it is true because it reflects 
the intention of God in the communication given to Joseph Smith. And what do you suppose it means having a form of godliness denying the power How do you deny the power of godliness? How do you obtain the power of godliness? What does it mean to have possession of the power of godliness? Let's go back to that section 76 again. It's, it's got... got some nice stuff in it. I want to go to the very end because we're going to run into the same notion um, in the first vision and in section 76. And 76 is a transcript that is given to Joseph uh, that was dictated um, transcribed, read back, approved, then the dictation continued until I reached the end. But look at beginning at verse 113. This is the end of the vision which we saw, which we were commanded to write while we were yet in the Spirit. But great and marvelous are the works of the Lord and the mysteries of his kingdom, which he showed unto us, which surpass all understanding in glory and in might and in dominion, which he commanded us we should not write while we were yet in the spirit and are not lawful for man to utter. Neither is man capable to make them known for they're only to be seen and understood by the power of the Holy Ghost which God bestows on those who love him and purify themselves before him to whom he grants this privilege of seeing and knowing for themselves that through the power and manifestation of the spirit while in the flesh they may be able to bear his presence in the world of glory is this related to not denying the power of godliness I mean to have the ability to bear his presence in the world of glory as we get farther along in our discussion about the topic of Zion, it becomes critical that you become able to bear his presence. For those who are unable to bear his presence will be destroyed at his coming. Therefore, whatever this power of godliness is, I think we need to get some. If you turn in Joseph Smith history to the next verse, verse 20, he says, He again forbade me to join with any of them, and many other things did he say unto me, which I cannot write at this time. That is always the case. Those the Lord ministers to invariably no more than they say. There are reasons for that. There are laws that involve that. In section 76, um, suggested that man is not even capable of making some things known. It's really hard to convey into this um, linear world things that um, don't relate well here. Turn back to Mormon, uh, in the Book of Mormon, Mormon, um, chapter 9. Um, I want to begin in verse 2 of chapter 9. Um, And this stuff really sounds ominous. 
So I'm going to read it with an ominous voice because I just, <laughs> I just want to make you feel all uh, that. Behold, uh, you know, this is Mormon. I mean, this is late in the gig. Um, he's lived an NC-17 life. Um, between the, the rape followed by the cannibalism of the uh, women that had been raped and the murder and the mayhem and the torture and the, I mean, um, this is the guy who abridged the Book of Mormon, okay? That's the life that he was subjected to. So, look at these words. Behold, will you believe in the day of your visitation? Behold, when the Lord shall come, yea, even that great day when the earth shall be rolled together as a scroll, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, yea, in that great day when you shall be brought to stand before the Lamb of God, then will you say that there is no God? Then will you longer deny the Christ? Or can you behold the Lamb of God? Do you suppose you shall dwell with him under a consciousness of your own guilt? Do you suppose you could be happy to dwell with that holy being when your souls are racked with a consciousness of guilt that you have ever abused his laws? Behold, I say unto you, you would be more miserable to dwell with a holy and just God under a consciousness of your filthiness before him than ye would to dwell with the damned souls in hell. For behold, when ye shall be brought to see your nakedness before God and the glory of God and the holiness of Jesus Christ, it will kindle a flame of unquenchable fire upon you. Now I want you to read those verses and ask yourself, exactly what is it that God is doing? The only thing that God is doing is being. He simply exists. This is you. God is. And he's simply revealing himself to you. And this is your reaction. And why is this your reaction? Because you don't have the power of godliness. And why don't you have that? Because you need to repent. And what is it that you must repent of? The absence of knowledge about God. You don't know enough yet to be saved. The plan of salvation is the plan of education, the plan of knowledge about God and the principles of godliness and the basis upon which all of you can live together and be of one heart and one mind and it doesn't matter that some of you have strange political beliefs and it doesn't matter that some of you would like to see every gun in the universe recalled and melted down so we could all, I don't know, attack one another with the remaining butts of the guns that weren't melted down because there would. I don't I mean, and others of you would like every child issued their own concealed carry permit and to, to be armed in kindergarten. <laughs> None of that stuff separates you from being able to love one another and be one. Because much of what you think matters it doesn't matter one whit to the Lord. And you know what? When you're anxiously engaged in the right cause, you'd be surprised how much of our deepest concerns are merely trivial. The things of the heart are what matters. The things upon which we are capable of becoming one in love toward one another. 
are infinitely greater. That's why we really need to keep you distracted in this celestial kingdom about all the crap that goes on down here. You're worried about the Kardashians. It doesn't matter. I suppose at a certain level, it's possible that the Red Sox don't even matter. <laughs> but we're eight and a half games ahead in the AL East right now. And, and I'm telling you, it's looking good. <clears throat> in any event, you take, you mark that page, um, 484 in your Book of Mormon, and you go back and you reread that, and you ask yourself, what is God doing other than merely being? The only thing he does is be. And then you react because you are running around hysterically doing a pee dance because you're all concerned that your, your presence is unacceptable, um, you're unclean, you're unworthy. That's what he came to fix. And when he fixes it, part of the fix consists of telling you, set it aside. Set it aside. Be my child. Accept love. And then in turn, you love. Because what fixes is love. Well, Joseph Smith said, and this goes hand in hand with that, that uh, Mormon chapter 9, verses 2 to 5. A man is his own tormentor and his own condemnor. The torment of disappointment in the mind of man is as exquisite as a lake burning with fire and brimstone. Inflict that upon yourself. And the quickest way to achieve that is to act in this life like the coward who is unwilling to be valiant in the testimony of Christ and to stand up when opposed by those who tell you it ought not to be so. Valiance is the only way by which you secure the blessings of God. When Uriah was killed, he was killed with a message sent by King David, delivered by the hand of Uriah himself to Joab. In the integrity of his heart, King David knew Uriah could be trusted with the order condemning him to die. And Uriah, faithful to his king, carried the message to Joab. There are accounts, not the one we have in our Old Testament version. There are accounts that suggest that when Joab opened the message and read it, that he read it to Uriah. And Uriah knew he was sent to his death. And in those accounts, the men who died with Uriah died with him wittingly. It's one of the few places in Scripture where the word valiant appears. Those men went where the valiant men were. And the unworthy king forfeited something in his cowardice. Don't be cowards. Stand and be valiant. No matter what it is. In the day of judgment, you will find yourself wanting. And in this life, you will find you lack the power of godliness unless you obey the law upon which all blessings are predicated. You make sacrifices. You obey him. And to obey him is to find yourself 
oddly incongruent with everything about you. Not about you. About you. Meaning the external world in which you find yourself moving about within. Well, why are they all corrupt? You know, there's a line happened to like Luke. I'll try and quote him when um, when he fits. He gave a talk one time on the road to Emmaus. It's drawn out of uh, the book of Luke. I think Luke was the other character that was walking. And he names um, Cleopas. He doesn't name himself. Well, Luke chapter 11 uh, This is verse uh, 52. Oh, I love this. We ought to be, we ought to, we ought to carve this on the uh, Utah bar office, uh, mm-hmm. exterior and lobby on the interior. Require lawyers to put it on their business cards. <laughs> Woe unto you lawyers! For you've taken away the key of knowledge. Ye enter not in yourselves, and them that were entering ye hindered. False teachers prevent others from obtaining salvation. Period. And happily, they will be accountable for that. You've taken away the key of knowledge. You enter not in yourselves. Them that were entering in, you hindered. Well, there's another verse in DNC section 121. This would be one written um, in the um, year following the the Joseph Smith uh, testimony. Um, This one is written. Joseph was sentenced to die uh, on November 1st of 1838. Uh, general who was supposed to carry out the uh, execution rebelled wouldn't do that Joseph ultimately wound up being kept in prison in Liberty Jail while he's in Liberty Jail he writes a letter we've taken out three excerpts from the letter and we've canonized them and section 121 is one of those three sections I want you to look at verse 45 Um, verse 45 uh, ask yourself whether this has something to do also with the uh, power of godliness. Let thy bowels also be full of charity towards all men and to the household of faith, and let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. Then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God, and the doctrine of the priesthood shall distill upon thy soul as the dews from heaven. The Holy Ghost shall be thy constant companion and thy scepter, an unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth, and thy dominion shall be an everlasting dominion, and without compulsory means it shall flow unto thee forever and ever. Oh, that I had the ability to declare it. This is in the middle of one of the three great principles by which God governs and shapes the universe itself. It is not through compulsory means. The only way in which God works is by inviting and enticing. You break yourself against the laws that are ordained. You condemn yourself by the things that you bring upon yourself. God just is. And he is to give you opportunity. And he opens opportunity to allow you to enter in if you're willing to enter in. But whether you're willing to enter in or not is predicated upon your own conduct, your own desires. And the best way to determine what your desires are are based upon what it is you do. We are so situated that we have the inability to do two things at once. No matter who you are, you are only doing one thing at a time your entire life. You're either focusing on one thing or on something else. 
and whatever it is upon which you dwell, that's what you've chosen. Hence the saying, let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly, then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God. Is the power of godliness related to that? Is the power of godliness related to the presence of God? Well, the Book of Mormon continually declares that to be the case. And anyone that suggests otherwise is flatly contradicting the message of the Book of Mormon. It is all about the ascent back to the presence of God. Testimony after testimony, experience after experience. That's what the Book of Mormon stands for. That is the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You encounter it almost immediately in the first chapter when Lehi rises up. And you encounter it in Nephi, and you encounter it in Jacob, and you encounter it in Enos, and in Alma, and in Mosiah. And you just continually get the same message. Joseph Smith said, I advise all to go on to perfection and search deeper and deeper into the mysteries of godliness. Turn to Doctrine and Covenants section 8. This is one of those interesting little notes. Um, Oliver wanted to translate. This was in April of 1829. He had arrived to become the... um, uh, scribe to Joseph uh, shortly before this and he tried to translate, it didn't work out so well, he told him in verse 2 I'll tell you in your mind and your heart by the Holy Ghost and so on he talks about a gift that he has the gift of Aaron um, that's the rod he was able to use a divining rod we're kind of embarrassed about that now Ooh, and we don't really preserve that much anymore because we think gifts like that are kind of wacky and yet here it is in scripture and some of you probably have gifts that you find a little odd and yet you all have gifts and not everyone has the same gift and if it gives you access to information from a divine source you ought to trust it And it doesn't matter that the way in which you do it and the way in which someone else does it is differently situated. Uh, No one had ever thought about a seer stone until Joseph Smith encountered it and then found it ratified in the Book of Mormon, in uh, the Book of Mosiah. Well, in any event. Um... I'm interested in verses 10 and 11 in the revelation given to Joseph in April of 1829 where it says, Remember that without faith you can do nothing. Therefore, ask in faith. Trifle not with these things. Do not ask for that which you ought not. So, okay, don't, you got to be careful. Don't you ask for something that you ought not be asking for. For goodness sake, es es prohibito. Okay? (laughs) Followed immediately by this statement. Ask that you may know the mysteries of God. That's a commandment. And anyone that tells you you ought not be searching deeper and deeper into the mysteries of God, well, I think we just read about him in Luke, didn't we? You don't enter in yourself and you don't suffer those that are entering in to be permitted to go. Because you do not understand the the power of godliness. You deny the power of godliness. I declare to you in the words of Scripture, ask that you may know the mysteries of God. That's a commandment given to us by revelation, enshrined in the scriptures that you folks claim to believe in. Stop denying the power of godliness and stop falling for the sophists and lawyers who would deceive you by suggesting that you should not inquire into the mysteries of God 
They are antichrist. They are opposed to the doctrine of salvation. They deny the power of godliness, and I do not. Well, we've now gotten 20 verses into the history of Joseph Smith and we've learned that he's learned a bunch of stuff and he's told that there's some things he can't write. I want to know at this point, how do you know if Joseph is telling the truth? How do you know if what you're seeing here is a true testimony or not? How are you to fix that? How are you to know that? Doctrine and Covenants section 63. This is, um, this is a reminder of, of the stakes involved in preaching falsely. This is Doctrine and Covenants section 63. Look at verses, beginning at verse 60 and going to 62. Behold, I am Alpha and Omega, even Jesus Christ. Wherefore, let all men beware how they take my name in their lips. For behold, verily I say, that many there be who are under this condemnation, who use the name of the Lord and use it in vain, having not authority. And how do you know if someone speaks with authority? How do you know that Joseph is writing a testimony that is authoritative? How do we know if anyone opens their mouth and they speak and God has approved the message that they are delivering? How are we to know that? Go to Doctrine and Covenants section 5. This is March of 1829. Uh, Oliver Cowdery wouldn't arrive until April the 15th, or excuse me, April the 5th, the month following this. Um, oh, this is interesting. <clears throat> look, look at verse 3. And I have caused you, this is a revelation to Joseph, and I've caused you that you should enter into a covenant with me that you should not show them except those persons to whom I commanded you, and you have no power over them except I granted unto you. At this moment in 1829, Joseph Smith is perhaps the only man alive who had a covenant with uh, the Lord. You've entered into a covenant with me. Now, were all the beneficiaries of covenants that existed from the beginning. But in terms of someone with whom the Lord has struck a bargain and made a covenant, at this moment in 1829, our Lord is a man of covenant making. Our Lord um, uh, enters into covenants on a regular basis. To know him is to covenant with him. And Joseph at this point, um, at this point, has one. And you have a gift to translate the plates, and this is the first gift that I bestow upon you, and I've commanded you that you should not pretend to, that you should pretend to no other gift until my purpose is fulfilled in this. Okay. Now I want you to mark that. I want you to notice that Joseph is being told by God don't pretend to any other gift than this translation. Why go back to that verse 20 of the Joseph Smith history, which happened in um, 1820, in which Joseph had been tutored, and he had been tutored by the Lord with many other things did he say unto me at this time, which I cannot write. Joseph already knew, he had already seen, he'd already been endowed with a certain um, 
understanding that reckons from the other side of the veil, as a consequence of which Joseph knew a great deal more than what he was saying. But he had an assignment, and the assignment consisted of the obligation to translate the Book of Mormon. And Joseph was authorized to accomplish that work. Therefore, if Joseph stepped outside of the bounds of the assignment entrusted to him at the moment that he was doing this work, Joseph would be entertaining a pretense because the errand given to him at the moment was confined to the Book of Mormon. Did he know more? Absolutely. Did he have more at his disposal that he could have entertained people with? Without any question. But he was asked to do a work. And in the fidelity of his heart, he confined himself to that work until it was first accomplished. And to do more than that would have been a pretense. So then we get to the answer to the question about how you know whether Joseph is telling us the truth. Verily I say unto you, verse 5, Woe shall come unto the inhabitants of the earth if they will not hearken unto my words. This is Christ owning the words. It's not Joseph. <coughs> For hereafter you shall be ordained to go forth and deliver my words unto the children of men. Behold, if they will not believe my words, they would not believe you, my servant Joseph, if it were possible that you should show all these things which I have committed unto you. God owns the words. You wouldn't believe the rest of it if you won't believe what's authorized to be spoken. Joseph confined himself to delivering what Christ wanted delivered, and it was up to those who heard to choose. And if they recognized the master's voice, then they've received a message from him. Behold, verily I say unto you, oh, wait, I left out eight. Oh, this unbelieving and stiff-necked generation. Mine anger is kindled against them. Behold, verily I say unto you, I reserve those things which I entrusted unto you, my servant Joseph, for a wise purpose in me. And it should be made known unto future generations. But this generation shall have my word through you. Well, in another place, well, heck, we may as well get that out. I mean, another place. Uh, this is also a letter from Liberty Jail. Um, uh, section 122, verse 2. The pure in heart and the wise and the noble and the virtuous shall seek counsel and authority and blessings constantly from under thy hand. This is the Lord's word to Joseph Smith about those who are wise, those who are noble, those who are virtuous, those are the ones that are going to seek counsel and authority and blessings under the hand of Joseph. And that is as true at this moment as it was then. How then do we today receive blessings under the hand of Joseph? Well, if you look at the use of the word hand, almost invariably it is associated with the words we find in scriptures. The book of Abraham, under the hand of Abraham. The Book of Mormon, under the hand of Mormon. The hand of Joseph is still the hand we ought to be looking at. 
if we want to know what God's word was for our generation. You have no clue. You have no clue how thoroughly we have supplanted the words given at the hand of Joseph Smith and what it is you entertain yourselves with each Sabbath day. Well, verse 14. To none else will I grant this power to receive this same testimony among this generation and this the beginning of the rising up of the coming forth of my church out of the wilderness. Clear as the moon, fair as the sun, terrible as an army with banners. Clear as the moon. What chapter are you? Oh, I'm still in verse 5 or section 5 of the Doctrine and Covenants. I'm now at verse 14. The description, and this description will show up another time in the um, in the um, uh, dedica- dedicatory prayer to the uh, the Kirtland Temple in section 109. But it's it's a description of the Lord's church. The Lord's church is clear as the moon, fair as the sun. Clear as the moon means that those who rise up and attain to the status of being acknowledged by Him as His church they meet the description that is given in Doctrine and Covenants section 76 describing those who have the glory of the moon as their inheritance. Fair as the sun is described in Doctrine and Covenants section 76 describing those who will inherit the celestial glory. That's his church. And they'll be the only ones who are able to stand at his coming. The minister for those in the terrestrial glory is the Son, meaning the Son of God, who intends to make many sons of God. And in the celestial glory, the fullness of the Father dwells. And so the church, which he owns, which he calls mine, that he intends to bring out of the wilderness of darkness and confusion and into the light by which they can understand the things of God, is necessarily composed of those who have sufficient knowledge to be clear as the moon, fair as the sun and terrible as an army with banners because when we get to Grand Junction and we're talking about the condition of Zion we're going to be looking at how very very perilous it is to encounter this kind of glory when you're unprepared to be there Well, Luke chapter 9, let's go there. This is my man. Um, Luke chapter 9, verse 25 and 26. What is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come to his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. See, if Joseph is speaking the words of the Son, and if you are ashamed to own the words that come to us by the hand of Joseph, your shame is not toward Joseph. Your shame is towards him who taught Joseph the words to speak. Verse 26. 
of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. Well, Joseph's credential was his possession of Christ's words. Did he come with authority? Did he speak Christ's words? Had Christ entrusted him with a ministry and a message? If the answer to that is yes, then he came with authority. If the answer to that is, well, no, but I mean, he had some quotable moments, you know. I liked him a lot, you know. It's kind of grooving up slowly. It's got mojo filter. I mean, um, it's all vain. It's all vanity. It's all nonsense if he doesn't have a message from God. And if he does, then his credential is that, his message. Now, how do you know that? Oh, didn't we stumble across that just a few minutes ago? James 1.5. Everything that's going on in the restoration comes back to James 1.5. Why don't you ask God who giveth to all men liberally and who would like you to know a great deal more than you presently do? He doesn't upbraid. He doesn't scold you. He doesn't say the mysteries are off limits. He says, come and learn of me. He says, I command you to ask and inquire into the mysteries of God. He says, salvation itself is dependent upon knowledge. And this is life eternal, that you may know Christ. How can you serve the master you don't know? Well... Let's skip ahead to verse, uh, this is Joseph Smith history, verse 26. Well, I don't know, I gotta, <clears throat> I gotta look at 25 too. <laughs> so it was with me, I had actually seen a light, and in the midst of that light, I saw two personages. They did in reality speak to me though I was hated and persecuted for saying that I had seen a vision, yet it was true. While they were persecuting me, reviling me, speaking all manner of evil against me, falsely, for so saying, I was led to say in my heart, why persecute me for telling the truth? That will always be the case if you know Christ. That will always be the case. Because those who know him not disbelieve that you know him. There are laws ordained before the foundation of the world. They must serve their father. And you must serve yours. There is no other choice. There are only two teams there are only two churches. There are only two ways. And it doesn't matter if the particular whore you choose to follow is comely, tidy, well-mannered, and wearing a white wedding dress. There are only two churches. And one is Christ's. Well, so verse 26. I had now got my mind satisfied so far as the sectarian world was concerned that it was not my duty to join with any of them but to continue as I was until further directed. 
Now, isn't that interesting? Here you got Joseph. He has now been given instruction, and he's simply assuming that he goes his way until he gets some further direction. And this will go on for years, mind you. Years. In the Joseph Smith translation of um, Matthew chapter 3, we won't look at that, uh, he talks about the difference between um, what happened in the incident at the temple when Christ was 12 years old and then what happens when he begins his ministry. And it talks about many years pass um, while he labored as a carpenter. The hour of his ministry drew nigh. Well, so Joseph is waiting until he finds out um, what else he ought to do. Verse 27. Oh, look at that. 21st of September, 1823. This is another one of the corners of the earth. Uh, this is the um, autumnal equinox when everything is in balance. The light and the dark a moment that will soon be upon us. This being September 10th. Um, and he reflects in verse 28. He says, about halfway down, there's this dash about the middle. I was left to all kinds of temptation and mingled with all kinds of society. I frequently fell into many foolish errors and displayed the weaknesses of youth and the foibles of human nature, which, I'm sorry to say, led me into divers temptations, offensive in the sight of God. In making this confession, no one need suppose me guilty of any great or malignant sins. A disposition to commit, commit such was never in my nature, but I was guilty of levity and sometimes associated with jovial company, etc., not consistent with that character which ought to be maintained by one that was called of God as I had been. But this will not seem very strange to anyone who recollects my youth and is acquainted with my native cheery temperament. As an aside, Christ has a cheery temperament. Joseph has a cheery temperament. Be of good cheer. You see, reading this testimony of Joseph Smith, given in 1838, following the trial in April of 1838, in which the allegations of adultery were leveled against him by Oliver Cowdery, and the minutes of the High Council um, talking about, said they dealt with the girl business, the allegations about the girl business, and Joseph was exonerated. You know, um, We entertain a lot of false notions about um, Joseph Smith and the practice of plural marriage. Um, Hales has been doing, and completed, and is now out with a three-volume set. In there, he, he, he gathers together that Joseph didn't think himself entitled. Well, so on the above-mentioned night of the 21st of September, this is uh, verse uh, 29 on the next page, um, I retired to bed for night. I betook myself to prayer and supplication to Almighty God for forgiveness of all my sins and follies. Um, so he had waited, but he waited until he got to the point in which he had some apprehension about his standing before God because it had been a long time. But notice that it's Joseph who is driving the events that will occur now on the autumnal equinox when he makes an inquiry involving his sins, and he's asking, he's supplicating for forgiveness of his stand, sins, and he also wants to know of his state and standing before him, saying at the end of verse 29, I had full confidence in obtaining a divine manifestation as I previously had one. If Joseph Smith can go get a divine manifestation respecting his standing before God, so can you. If Joseph Smith can go out and inquire to know of God what church to join, so can you. 
Moroni 10, 4 and 5, particularly 10, 5, tells you that by the power of the Holy Ghost you may know the truth of all things. The truth of all things. There is nothing off limits. There is nothing about which you're going to be upbraided and told, don't ask, don't inquire, I won't tell. Now, you may ask for something that you're unprepared to hear the answer for because there's some preparation yet left. But if you ask, you set in motion on the other side permission to fix what's wrong with you. Have you read the 10th parable? If you read the 10th parable, you know there's a time lag in which a missing virtue gets supplied as a consequence of real-world experience. The answer gets set in motion as a consequence of the laws of God upon which all blessings are predicated, which mandate, as we're seeing here in this verse, that you must ask. And by the way, the answer to the question that you ask from God will always be yes. However, if you're not ready for the yes, then you're going to go through a period of renovation and repair. How long you need to be renovated and repaired depends upon just how much of the toxic nonsense you've drunk in and how much of it you continue to drink in that opposes the ability of God to speak to you. So soon as you will lay down that nonsense and in faith be believing, so soon will God be able to plug the leaks, repair the hinge, fix the broken window. He really does have a house of order. Or better put, a temple that is holy. Which temple ye are? It's not built by human hands. It was built by God in the womb of your mother. And you were endowed with it when you took your first breath. That, you're wearing it now, is his temple. The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. But it must not be defiled. Clean yourselves up. If you want to know what your state and standing is because you're uncertain, we're reading in the Joseph Smith testimony. Look at the next verse. While I was thus in the act of calling upon God, every single one of the existing source materials involving um, Fanny Alger, and in the, the account dealing with Fanny Alger um, and the incident in the barn that some people have blown up into uh, Emma Smith uh, catching Joseph Smith in the very act of intercourse in the barn with Fanny Alger, when you track it down and you read the account, what you find out is that Emma Smith witnessed the transaction. The transaction consists of Levi Hancock performing a wedding ceremony in the barn, Joseph Smith telling Levi the words to use, Levi performing the ceremony, Emma at the door listening in, and this is the transaction which has become subsequently embellished into all sorts of libido-driven license for those who would like a less virtuous prophet than the one we have. 
No one need suppose me guilty of any great or malignant sins. A disposition to commit such was never in my nature. It wasn't in Joseph's nature. And those who claim otherwise are looking for a license. In the act of calling upon God, if you're in the right way, with the right faith, looking for the right answers, you don't even get to finish the sentence. God knows what you have need of even before you ask. It's on the Sermon on the Mount. Christ tells you that. That horrible aching, that longing, that hollowness, that emptiness within you is what Christ was designed to fill. That's his purpose in coming to his temple. So while he was in the act of calling upon God, he discovered a light appearing in his room, which continued to increase until the room was lighter than at noonday, when immediately a personage appeared at my bedside, standing in the air, for his feet did not touch the ground. Uh, it's an interesting aside. I want to ask the question, why? Why did Moroni stand in the air, his feet not touching the ground? It's an interesting topic. We're not going to talk about it here. It's off subject. It won't get us to Zion anyway. But there's stuff here. Oh, and look at this. He had on a loose robe of most exquisite whiteness. It was a whiteness beyond anything earthly I'd ever seen, nor do I believe that any earthly thing could be made to appear so exceedingly white and brilliant. His hands were naked, his arms also a little above the wrist, as also were his feet naked, as were his legs a little above the ankles. His head and neck were also bare. I could discover he had no, no other clothing on, but this robe was open so I could see to his bosom. Notice this. This is not ceremonial garb. As a consequence of which, I can tell you that it's okay to be buried without temple regalia because you're not going to be wearing that stuff in the resurrection anyway if you inherit what the angels of God including Moroni who was certainly exalted wear you can read about the description of what Christ wears in the scriptures as well ceremonial garb is just that it is ceremonial garb it is designed to teach you about the creation to endow you with certain knowledge about the process of being exalted. But it is not the attire that you'll see on the streets of heaven. I actually think... I, I think they look Egyptian. I think their attire looks Egyptian, but that's neither here nor there. Um... This is a guy who is wearing um, only a robe. It's not ceremonial. He doesn't have um, shoes on his feet. He doesn't have a bonnet on. He doesn't have a variety of things that we would associate with ceremonial dress. Um, you can read a description of Christ's attire in 3 Nephi chapter 11, verse 8. And the description there is very much like the description that we have here. Christ and um, Moroni wearing the same kind of thing. And then, hey, just for the fun of it, let's go back to Exodus 28. Um, Exodus 28. I want to I revert back to my Cecil B. DeMille-esque stuff. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate and an ephod and a robe and a broidered coat, a mitre and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and yellow and green and purple and orange and white. And... I'm sorry. 
Uh, you can read it. It's in here. Ooh, the ouches of gold and the chains of pure gold at the end of the wreath and work. I mean, he dresses you in funny attire, okay? God goes through in the ceremonial attire and he dresses you up and the purpose of the dress is ceremonial to communicate to you through symbolism knowledge about certain things, but they are not an end. They are a symbol. Six days of creation, six articles of clothing, each one of which can be associated with one of the days of creation. Therefore, as you enter through the veil, it is as if the entirety of all creation is redeemed in your person. You represent salvation for the entirety of creation because in you, should you be able to be rescued, creation itself continues. These are symbols. They communicate to the mind ideas, ideas that are eternal. They're not ends in themselves. Well, keep that in mind because you're here to be trained. You're here to learn something. You're here to learn about the power of godliness. And by here, I don't mean this room tonight, although I think that is certainly true. I'm talking about this lifetime in which you find yourself. This place this terrible fallen world, this glorious opportunity in which sacrifice is actually possible. You don't avoid it, and you don't necessarily seek it out. But when it comes upon you, you face it down bravely, and you stand where God places you, and you don't let any man move you from where it is that God would have you be. Because therein lies salvation. You're obeying a law ordained before the foundation of the world. You can't lay hold upon such blessings unless you obey the law upon which it is predicated. There will always be, in absolute numbers, only a few who will find that straight and narrow path. There will be an overflowing abundance of those who will fight against it because they serve their master. You don't have time to worry about them. You serve yours. And that master needs to be Christ. Well... We're now just about getting to, oh, shoot, tonight's topic. (laughs) Once again, um, Joseph uh, is called by name. This is verse 33. Um, He was afraid. The fear soon left him. The reason he was afraid was because he was seeking forgiveness of his sins. A perfectly white, bright, lit individual appears who represents the cleanliness of heaven itself. Joseph, in contrast to that, he's inquiring to know about his sins. Now, a visibly cleansed being stands before him. He's afraid. And why is he afraid? Because once again, you see the remarkable contrast. I know what lies in my heart. I know what failings I have had. And I know this being can see through me. Therefore, I need something that will remove from me my fear. He called me by name. It's the same thing. Moroni dispels him by letting him know we have a brotherhood. We have a relationship. Fear soon left me. He called me by name. (laughs) Well, this is what we want to talk about. He tells him about the the stuff, the accoutrements that he's going to be handed in verse... uh, you know, 34 and 35, but then he gets in verse 36, and this is where, ooh, this is where we got something now. This is Moroni delivering a message, but his message is not like we find in the King James Version of the Bible. He says, 
Behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall burn as stubble, for they, they that come shall burn them, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Root, branch, genealogical words. They that come, who are they? Again, he quoted the fifth verse. Behold, I'll reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He quoted the next verse differently. He said, he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. Uh, we'll probably get this parsed about um, Spanish Fork um, in the coming year. Everything about this is telling you something that is remarkably different from where we find ourselves. The day is coming that will burn them. When? They that come. Who? Neither root nor branch. This is genealogical. Elijah and the priesthood. We'll, we'll talk about that on another day. Children get planted in their hearts. Promises made to the fathers. Children's hearts turn to their fathers. There is so much in that that we need to pick apart. We need to understand, and we're going to go there, because understanding this is understanding the foundation of Zion. The foundation of Zion consists largely in reconnecting the children as a consequence of the promises that were made to the fathers back to the fathers so that there might be a wielding link that connects the children who are on the earth with the fathers who are in heaven, not your kindred dead that are in the spirit world. They are in desperate need of your ministration to save them. Connecting yourself to them is to connect yourself with the, essentially the damned, the dead, the disembodied. The fathers who are in heaven are the ones to whom you need to form the link. And I've written that paper on it, which I assume some of you have read. And if you haven't, just send a note to the blog and I'll, I'll email it to you. Uh, it's the mission of Elijah Reconsidered. Um, but see, the whole purpose behind this is to fix this problem because if it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted, utterly wasted at his coming. Um... Then he says, um, quoted the 11th chapter of Isaiah saying that it was about to be fulfilled. Okay, um, let's go back to that 11th chapter of Isaiah because, man, if we made a mess of that. Okay, this is um, about to be fulfilled. There shall come forth. This is chapter 11 of Isaiah. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. The rod is a servant who is a descendant of Jesse, who is a Levite, and Ephraim, unto whom is rightly belonging the priesthood. Um, Keep your finger there on that 11, uh, chapter 11 of Isaiah and turn back to Doctrine and Covenants section 113 and you'll see where um, these words are, are um, explained. Um, it was a stem spoken of. Um, Verily thus saith the Lord, it is Christ. Verse 3. What is the rod spoken of in the fifth verse of the 11th chapter of Isaiah that should come 
of the stem of Jesse. Behold, saith the Lord, it is a servant, a servant in the hands of Christ, who's partly a descendant of Jesse, as well as of Ephraim, or the house of Joseph, on whom there is laid much power. Well, look. Until you succeed, you fail. I don't care who comes along claiming whatever they want to claim. Until the work is done, you can't take credit for it. Period. There's all kinds of nonsense that circulates about who has the keys, button, button, who's got the button. <laughs> Look, someone's going to do a work. When the work is done, you will know. Until the work is done, no one can be identified with a role. Period. It is arrogance, it is pretentiousness, it is foolishness for anyone to step forward and to say, I, I, I am that man. Do the work. Finish the course. Fulfill the covenant. You do that, you can take the name. Until you do the work, it's just noise. So there's going to come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Oh, thank God, someone will finally fear the Lord more than they fear man. I look forward to that moment. You should make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. You should not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. In this context, it is the word of God. And with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked, and the righteous shall be the girdle of his righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. These things are shortly to come to pass. And the cow and the bear shall feed. And the young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Suckling child shall play in the hole of the asp, and the wean child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You see, um, it's knowledge, full of knowledge of the Lord. That's what you have to lay hold on. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left. Well, it shall shortly come to pass. Not then, not that day, by and by. You know, when a branch is spoken of, if you look at John 15, 1 to 6, I'm not going to do that because our time is far spent, but Christ gives a sermon about him being the true vine and how you cannot bear fruit unless you're connected to the true vine. Once again, that is a genealogical term. That is a family of God term. That is a son of God term. And he intends to make many sons of God. Joseph is receiving in this first interview with the angel Moroni an announcement about the first indications of the restoration 
of God's intent to restore a holy family. God is telling us what he wants. He, God, wants to have upon the earth again. His family. But we must respond. We. This is your dispensation. This is your time. You came down here with the intent of living and finding the things that will bring you back. This is your opportunity. Don't let some other group claim that it doesn't belong to you. These scriptures are only going to be fulfilled when enough people awaken and arise to realize that it is devolving upon you the obligation to find, to heed, to seek, to search, to pray, to obey, and to form what is necessary in order to fulfill the promises and the covenants that were made to the fathers. Throughout the coming year, we're going to try and, um, and lay that out. 2 Nephi chapter 3. Now, we could spend a day talking about this chapter 3. We don't have that time, and tonight's time is far spent. But what I want to do is to just look at some specific words for a moment, because I'm telling you, the muddle that has been made of the Book of Mormon by the nonsense that we believe about its words is worse than a Gordian knot. And how you sort that out at this point, it's a challenge um, that you ought to rise to by making it the subject of prayer and getting revelation. Because there's a story being told here. There's a covenant being described here. And there are things in play here that until you awake and arise and realize what the duties are that are devolving upon you, you don't have any chance of figuring out exactly what a mess we've made of the restoration of the gospel. All right. Verse 23. We're just going to do a couple of verses. Wherefore, because of this covenant, the covenant being described here is a covenant that was made by God with Joseph of Egypt. That guy, Joseph of Egypt. Because of this covenant... Thou, Joseph, the son of Lehi, thou art blessed. For thy seed, Joseph, Lehi, Lehi's son, thy seed shall not be destroyed. For they shall hearken unto the words of the book. That is, the descendants of Joseph, Lehi's son. And there, there shall rise up one mighty among them. Ask yourself if among is genealogical or merely associational. It doesn't say one from them which would be genealogical, it says among them. Someone's going to arise who's going to do much good, both in word and in deed, being an instrument in the hands of God with exceeding faith to work mighty wonders. 
and do that thing which is great in the sight of God under the bringing to pass of much restoration unto the house of Israel and unto the seed of thy brethren. Blessed art thou, Joseph. In all of what goes on in chapter 3 of 2 Nephi, dealing with the covenant about the Joseph of Egypt individual, the next chapter, which, you know, thanks be to E.B. Grandin and then Orson, um, because of the division of this into chapters, this was all one narrative at one point. Don't let the punctuation and chapter divisions fool you. Continuation of the statement, um, verse 2, for behold, he, that is not just Lehi, but Joseph, Joseph of Egypt, he prophesied concerning all his, Joseph of Egypt's seed, which includes some of you. Look, our time is spent, our agenda is not. There was another prophecy that's made by, um, by um, Moroni that's repeated in Acts that has this just real complicated um, structure because of past, present, future, time, and how it all fits together. Um, we'll pick it up there in Idaho Falls on the 28th. Um, about this time, 40 years ago today, I was at a post-baptismal party at the uh, Mortensen's house that would be breaking up oh, probably another 10 minutes from now, in which... Um, Jim asked me to give the opening prayer. Jim being the man of the house, don't you know? And Monty being the faithful wife and the descendant of the bunkers deferred to her husband in making that call. And um, I was rather giddy from, you know, I had never been baptized before. Um, my mom wished me to be a Baptist and she was worried that I was going to hell because I never joined any church, and then I got baptized a Mormon and removed all doubt. <laughs> uh, for her, anyway. Um, and uh, and I was a little too jocular of my native cherry temperament, being what it is. And uh, so Jim asked someone else who was a little more Mormon and reverent to give the damn prayer. And so someone else gave the prayer, and I felt a little chided and thought, guys, man, these Mormons are tight. Um, anyway, as the evening ensued, there was um, uh, a little more of my jocularity and a little less of the reverent thing. And some folks took offense, and you know, there was some jarring, there was some contention, and literally... Um, the spirit fled from the meeting that we were having and all these wonderful people and all the stuff that they had put themselves to um, because I'd been baptized, it was turning out to be a rather tragic evening. And so I interrupted and I insisted on the floor and I made people listen and I went around person by person and I talked to them. And I talked to them by the power of the Spirit with the gift of prophecy and I touched the hearts of everyone who was in that room and I didn't understand it at all that night but when we get a little farther into the testimony of Joseph Smith you find that on the occasion when Joseph and Oliver were baptized they immediately were given the gift of prophecy I could no more have given you the name for what happened. All that evening I understood was that I, by the influence outside and greater than me, 
was able to calm the disunity and reunite the hearts of the people that were with me. I can tell you now that I recognize what that was. But I was a few hours old initiate into this restoration process. It's been 40 years. This is going to be a year in which I put on display my gratitude for the opportunity afforded to me to be baptized for the remission of my sins and to testify about those things which I know to be true and about the work remaining undone that is devolving upon you to accomplish. This restoration merely got its toe in the door in the day of Joseph Smith. And hardly even that. The prophecies and the promises and the time and the opportunity are upon us. The question is, is this generation going to be just as careless, just as indifferent as the one when last a real prophet's voice was heard among us? When Joseph Smith could tell you, I know he lives because I've seen him. When Joseph Smith could say, God commanded me that I should bear record of him because I have seen him. It has been too long, too long between that moment and today. And it's time now that we stop running away from the conflict. It's time for us to be valiant once again. Do not be fearful. Cowardice and fear are the opposite of faith. If Joseph Smith in the ruins of 1838 can write the testimony that we find in the history of Joseph Smith as an act of audacious courage and faith and confidence in the work of God that he was pursuing despite the ruin that he saw the church existed in at that moment. If Joseph could do that, why can't you? I don't care what a tattered ruin is that you see around you today. Zion can come. We're still a few sessions away from encountering parts of that religion Joseph was uh, attempting to restore that are really most interesting. But I'm telling you, if you'll stay with this over the course of the next year, you're going to realize just how much of the restoration is left undone. There is nothing more delightful. There's nothing more delicious. There is nothing more exciting than the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We deliberately started this without an opening prayer. We're not going to have an opening prayer on any of these talks until Sunday's and there'll be a few of these on Sunday. One of them is going to be on Sunday in Logan. Another one is going to be on Sunday in Centerville. It'll be on October 6th. I haven't announced that yet, but on October 6th, we're going to, we're going to have another one of these. For those that are on Sunday, we will have an opening and a closing prayer. For those that are not on the Sabbath, I'm simply going to talk. But I'll tell you that I know what I'm talking about. 
if you will ask of God and listen to the Spirit, you'll be able to determine whether or not I speak his words. I don't think it matters if I could reveal to you all things. If you won't believe the things I can tell you, you certainly wouldn't believe the things I'm not telling you. <laughs> but I wouldn't blame you if you don't believe me. I really wouldn't. It is so hard to be believing. <laughs> this world is so acidic. This environment is so toxic. It's very hard to believe. I think that's one of the reasons why Christ accounts it as greater righteousness to believe when you hear than it is to know and to say that I know what I talk about. And I bear testimony to you that Jesus Christ lives. He matters. I don't. He can save you. I can't. I can report on the glory of this Lord of ours, but only he can dispense it. Of that I bear testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.